Markets don't like shocks, markets don't like extremes. We know that we can't fund our future. This is not a problem that we can shove under the carpet anymore. Hello and welcome to The Big Question. I'm Angela Barnes and today I'm joined by Vim Mesh, the CEO of the European Banking Federation. Now, 2024 has been a huge election year. We've had the European elections, we've had the elections in the UK, we've had the French elections and we've got the US ones to come as well. Now, when we look at what the market reaction has been, you know, running up to the elections and afterwards, it's been quite volatile. Um, but let's talk about Trump and potentially what impact a Trump win might have on the markets in Europe. Well, it's interesting uh, in a European show to start talking about the American uh, um, Americans and the United States, which is actually I, I can understand because of the impact it may have on markets. Having said that, if you look at the outcome of the European elections, and a lot uh, of people were worried about the, the uh, entrance of the far right, you see that the centre has prevailed. So in Europe, I don't worry that much. If you translate that to other parts, like, like for instance uh, France, the worry that could be there is um, the loss of the middle. Because markets don't like shocks, markets don't like extremes, and depending on what kind of government we will see, uh, markets will react accordingly. And that is a little bit the same uh, as in the United States. Normally, if Republicans win, there is this almost knee-jerk reaction of markets upwards, because Republicans may mean more emphasis on the economy, it may mean lower taxes, and that is positive. Having said that, the, of course, the uncertainty in the market is how uh, a newly elected President Trump would react to uh, geopolitical development. So that's the uncertainty. But in this uncertainty, I would say most is certain. Vim, let's talk about the Capital Markets Union. High on the political agenda uh, in Europe, on the outside looking in, it looks like little progress has been made over the last 10 years. And of course, it's high on the political agenda again for the next term. How do you think it's going? I agree with you that the Capital Markets Union was a great plan that stayed a plan for a long time. We analysed it to death, but we didn't do anything about it. Having said that, the political momentum is now there. And the reason for that is, is obvious. We need to fund our transition uh, to a more sustainable economy. We need to fund a, the digital transition. We need to spend more on defense. And every politician in, in Europe has made that calculation that they will not be able to fund that through tax money for citizens. And you need the banking sector to help there. But still that's not enough because banks give credits and they are limited by their balance sheet. So as the, the I would say, the solution, you have the Capital Markets Union, we really need a deeper and more liquid capital markets in Europe and we need to work on that and we've analysed it to death. We've been talking for years about the inability to harmonise bankruptcy law and really I don't believe that. Every lawyer in every member state tells us that they have the most beautiful bankruptcy law in the whole of Europe but it's all there to do the same thing so we need to make steps forward. But even more importantly, uh, we need to make steps forward with the tax regime because tax requires unanimity and none of the member states want to give up their uh, tax system to support the capital markets. And that's where we need to make progress. Yeah, it's uh, potentially a pipe dream then, the capital markets union. I don't think so because uh, this is a typical case where the wall is coming towards us. We know that we can't fund our future where European citizens cannot fund their pension, where we are not able to fund our defence. We are talking about competitiveness and strategic autonomy. If we don't do it now, we just lose out. This is not a problem that we can shove under the carpet anymore. So is it essentially then, if member states don't embrace the capital markets union and move forward on things like tax, is Europe simply going to fall behind, but continue to fall behind the US and China, for example? I am an optimist, so I don't like the have fallen or, uh, behind already. But we may fall behind if we don't seriously make work of investing in our own continent, 
investing in productivity, investing in the ability to fund ourselves. And one of the frustrations that we have is we have brilliant minds on this continent, but everybody always tells me that a fintech or a brilliant tech solution, they the first 20 million uh, of their company, uh, they invest in Europe and they build in Europe. And the moment they hit 20 million, they go to over the Atlantic to the United States because the capital markets and the uh, private equity are better developed. So we need to jump over our own shadow. It is really so clear. And it's not only to move for businesses, it's also for the future of our citizens because they need to be able to invest because there is trillions and trillions sitting aside on savings accounts. And actually with inflation, you're slowly lo lo losing money. So you want to give that share to citizens as well. So we're ready to help, but we need to move. Now, if EU citizens don't start investing, Vim, rather than keeping money in a, in a, in a bank account, gaining uh, minimum interest on savings, you know, how far could European citizens fall behind in terms of their wealth? It's not an easy question to answer because it's connected to everything. It's connected to the competitiveness. In the 2000s, we had, for instance, the Financial Services Action Plan, which gave a huge impetus because it helped financial markets forward, it helped cross-border banking, it helped payments, it helped consumer protection, and all of these things moved forward. So I would say that we need a similar plan, and through that, you need to really invest in, in this uh, in our own continent, getting the productivity up, and there are many areas in which we can rekindle uh, the economy, then we need to work on our productivity because you also want, you want people from the outside to invest in Europe. For that, we need to be attractive. We need to ask why so uh, few outside investors are nevertheless investing through the taxonomy in sustainable products, because the whole idea of being the most sustainable place to invest in the whole world is great. Many of the outside investors, when I travel outside Europe, tell me we've tested your taxonomy because we like the idea, but in the end, a very limited number of products came out. And then you ask, okay, does that mean that you have unsustainable products? That is a logical question. And they say no, but if you look, for instance, at investing in the car industry, you want to electrify cars, great idea. Nevertheless, you see that the taxonomy is so precise that it's not only about the electric car if something falls on the, uh, under the uh, taxonomy, it's also that it needs to have the noise requirements of tires. But every car manufacturer puts different tires on their car, so it's almost impossible to meet it. So love the idea, but make it workable. And then as well, do you think that there is a lack of financial literacy? an understanding in Europe on the continent when it comes to knowing how to invest and sort of being more risk averse, for example. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I've been working very closely on financial literacy in, the, in my previous job in the Netherlands and now again in, in the European Bank Federation where we have the European Money Week and the European Money Quiz, which is played by 150,000 kids every year. Um, so yes, but it's not the only part. It needs to be accessible, so transparent. There needs to be a high level of, uh, of consumer protection. So people need to feel safe. And then you also need to know what to choose. And even if you have an advisor, you need more financial literacy because you need to be able to ask the right questions. So you're absolutely correct. Not only do we need more financial literacy for children, so they know what compound interest is and they, they know the basics, but also for young adults, uh, and that is more, I would say, um, uh, investment literacy, that they know what to ask, what fits them, what fits their lifestyle. And then the other thing important to capital markets as well, of course, is the deeper pool of capital for, and green incentives for companies too. Uh, the EU Green Deal aims to build a Europe with clean energy and sustainable industries, as we know, with a target for climate neutrality by 2050. Now, many banks are still investing and in funding fossil fuels. Of course, this is a big pressure point in the industry right now. Um, are you seeing any changes in attitude? Well, interestingly, um there are tens of thousands of people in banks 
working on the green transition, on the sustainable transition of, our, of, of, of actually of the whole economy, because banks have a very important role in financing this green, green transition. Not policing it, but financing it. So yes, there is investment in fossil, fossil fuel, uh, and in my view, you need to help these energy companies to transition to a new future where they uh, will be fossil free, where they will have alternative sources of energy. Because the easy way for banks would be if we want to go from brown to green in one day, you just cut off all the um, investments that you do and you stop. But what have you done? Then you have undermined your role as a bank in society because this will lead to mass unemployment, it will lead to social unrest. And in my view, it's the duty of banks to set clear goals of what we expect when we fund the future of these kind of companies and that they have a clear plan to go to a fossil free future, but not cut off immediately. That would be completely irresponsible. And the US has the Inflation Reduction Act. Do you think that enough is being done to incentivize that transition among companies in Europe, the oil and gas companies, for example? I find it hard to judge very much on the Inflation Reduction Act. It's brilliant legislation because it has it had nothing to do with either inflation nor reduction, but it has everything to do with investment in the own economy. It is a huge impetus to invest in the economy of the United States. And I think that we could learn a little bit from that playbook. there's been a rise in popularity of neobanks among young people, like Monzo and Revolut, for example. Um, how are these type of uh, banking uh, apps and things, how are they disrupting the traditional banking sector, if at all? Interestingly, I like them. Say, a few years ago, we had the fintech revolution, and the whole idea on the fintech revolution was we will end banks tomorrow. But if you really looked at what fintech did, was actually pretty brilliant. They would take usually a part of the bank's value chain, come up with a brilliant, much easier, much more cost-effective solution, and market that. And so now you hear banks talk about threat of big techs, but not about fintechs. The reason is most of these fintechs have now been integrated in banks or have sold licenses to their product, and that works. Now, on the whole neobank, it's of course a brilliant idea to bring a bank that only uh, lives online. And that works as, as long as you play by the rules and then these neobanks have sometimes found that it's not so easy to have all the prudential requirements, to have all the supervisory requirements, to have all the know your clients, all the anti-money laundering, all the sanction legislation. And if they get through all that, great to welcome them. So you think there's something to be learned from these neobanks? Absolutely. The biggest thing we could learn from neobanks is if you look at the way they're organizing themselves and the speed to go from business decision to implementation, there's a lot to learn there. Let's hope we can apply the same with the Capital Markets Union. Oh, absolutely. Here. Well, thank you very much for joining us on The Big Question. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. And thank you very much for joining us as well on the show. Do keep across all our episodes on our Euronews YouTube channel and online under Euronews Business as well. You can catch all the Big Question episodes throughout the week. Thank you for watching.